Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, thanks for watching or whatever. So today we continue our story exploring those guys here. Um, where's my cursor? Here we go. Uh, the knots. So remember that last time I ended on the slide. Again, as a reminder, these are the three main topics of topology: graphs, surfaces, and knots. And well, spoiler, spoiler, they will appear equally shared over the example, for example, um, and they kind of will appear equally shared uh, over the course of this lecture. Um, so knots are the last topic, and a very, very beautiful topic. Um, the big difference between, well, surfaces and knots will be eventually that surfaces are actually easier. So they look more complicated because they're two-dimensional objects. Remember, these guys are 2D. I'm ignoring those guys for a second. These guys are 1D. But it turns out that the complexity of a knot, which comes from its knotting and not from its dimension, or its homeomorphism structure, because they are all just spheres, they're all just circles, is actually bigger than the complexity of a uh, surface. So for a surface, I, I, I can only say it 1 million and 12 times more. I know I sound like a broken record. But for a surface, we had the main theorem, which essentially tells you everything you need to know about them. It completely classifies surfaces, and it also gives you an algorithm how to kind of identify a surface. It can't get much better. For knots, the state of the arts is not that great. So knot theory is still an open field of research. So a lot of people get hooked up with it. Uh, it's very beautiful. And the only thing that we will essentially do is we show you, or I will show you, some steps towards a complete statement about knots, but we are very far away uh, for, for classifying knots. It's more like a collection of different Euler characteristic tricks um, that you can throw at your favorite knot. But it might not work in general. It will work for all knots with not too many crossings, but um, the usual problem in mathematics if we, when you do examples is the kind of the uh, bias of small numbers. So you will never ever draw uh, really big knots but most knots are, of course, really big in the sense that they have a lot of crossings. Anyway, for small knots, what I'm going to show you today and mostly then also next week is actually sufficient. So if I will ask you a question like, is this not the unknot, kind of the standard question you would ask, uh, one of the things that I'm going to show you will work. In general, let me just stress that, even at the end of the lecture, we won't have a complete answer. So in general, if, I, if I, you would ask me, you give me a very complicated knot, and ask is it the unknot, I, I, I usually have no, no, no chance to tell you, at least not with, uh, from what we learn here in this lecture. So knot theory is very beautiful, but actually it's a little bit deceiving. It's, it's more delicate than it actually looks like. Okay, so to get started before we do something new, let us recall what we seen last time. So the idea of knot theory is this embedding of those strings in three space, I should mention at this point that they are really just circles, they're one dimensional, there is no thickness. I just make it thicker such that you can see something. So this is infinitely thin, but um, in order for us to see anything, I, I make it a little bit like, like a tube. Uh, but it's not a tube, it's really infinitely thin. Anyway, so we close up the ends because otherwise we can uh, always open it. And e essentially everything else, uh, as long as it's a continuous movement in space, is allowed. You're not allowed to cut the knot, we will see that in a second, um, but otherwise essentially everything you ever want to do is, is allowed. So let's wait for the cut. It will come now. So if you cut the knot, the problem with cutting the knot is then you can undo it. And it would be boring because then all knots would be trivial and our whole theory kind of falls apart. It, it's just a theory of nothing essentially. And that would be a bit boring. So the only non-allowed operation essentially is some version of cut the knot. So cut the knot is not what we want to do here. Okay, so let's get a little bit further with uh, knots. Remember that the correct equivalence for knots was very different from the one for surfaces or graphs, and it's essentially the one that tells you that you can move knots in space, as in the video uh, we have seen on what, a few seconds ago. Okay, um, maybe you remember, so I did that for the surfaces as well, and we need to do it here as well, because in the end, 
we want to translate topology into combinatorics. So some kind of continuous movements in space, they're always very hard. So it would be much better to have some combinatorial tools, some combinatorial setting to study knots. We did the same with surfaces, which was just polygon decomposition of surfaces. And we do the same here. Um, a polygon knot is just, well, I show you a picture, is just, I show you several pictures, is just exactly, uh, come on, come on, move. Move is exactly this one here. So uh, it has finally many vertices, and between the vertices there's a straight line segment. That's a polygon knot. Um, and of course, it's kind of a combinatorial version of the pictures I showed you before. And in fact, everything essentially you can draw has some polygonal form. So this assumption on studying polygon knots, which we will do from now onwards essentially, I'm going to, into, into details in a second, is mostly for convenience. But I will show you some more precise statements later. This is completely comparable to, to what I did with surfaces. But maybe it wasn't so clear with surfaces, so let me just say it again. We essentially assumed that the surface has a polygon decomposition and took it from there. And now we assume that a knot has a polygon form. It's exactly the same idea, just one dimension lower, and we take it from there. Okay? I will show you some examples of knots that do not have a polygon form. So not all knots do, but essentially any knot that we care about does have a polygon form. Okay, so it's really just a finite union of those line segments. And the point is we make them kind of straight. And you can have as many vertices as you want. So here would be a very silly, uh, I guess, polygon form of the unknot. So this approximates uh, this, this guy here. Remember, the unknot is just the not, not, the not knotty thing. So the, the beast that is not knotted. And the point is, and I will show you to the, the, uh, the, the point of today's lecture is to show you the corresponding statement, the corresponding theorem. So we can then push, under this assumption, we can push all knot theory into combinatorics. And combinatorics is just easier to handle, and we just have a very nice way of, of handling it, ex exactly like for surfaces. We can uh, do some combinatorial statements. Um, with the surfaces, it was mostly about the polygons. And we'll see what it is here, actually. Right, so the whole point is that I'm doing this to order to have some version of combinatorics. OK, here's a maybe better example of a polygon form of the unknot. I omit drawing the vertices, but the vertices are, of course, the, the points, uh, the, the, the pointy points. The, uh, the trefoil, the figure eight knot, and so on. So a lot of vertices and then just straight line segments between them, and you can do this with essentially all knots. Um, and we can actually, on polygon knots, we can do the following simplification of the equivalence. So the polygon knots are the same if they have the same subdivision, and you can just uh, pull uh, still the polygons around. OK. And let me just stress once, once really beautiful pictures. So we'll see very beautiful pictures in a second why I need this assumption. So from now on, I will drop the adjective, but all knots will be polygon knots. I will never draw those pictures again, but I've always assumed that there is some polygon form. And I will need that for the main theorem about knots uh, that we will see in about 20 minutes or so. And I'll say it twice because it's important, all knots are polygon knots. And why do I want that? Well, first of all, Literally anything that kind of we want will be a polygon knot anyway. But there are some beasts around. So um, the assumption on being continuous is very weak. Real numbers are very strange. And continuous functions in real numbers are very strange. And we kind of want to get rid of two weird knots. I will show you some nice pictures in a second. And indeed, our theorems do not apply to those knots. So in case you ever want to study those guys, you need a different theory. Really beautiful pictures, so we'll see one in a section in a second. And I stress it again, this is not a big restriction. We kind of kick out strange things. Everything you can ever draw in finite time will be a polygon knot because you can essentially by because you can draw it in finite time, you can also just draw it as a as a polygon uh, knot. But kind of very strange limit type objects 
that exists in the, in the continuous definition of a knot is just a continuous embedding of the circle into space, they are not polygon. And we just kicked them out of our theory. So these things are not good. So you can think of a knot that is a knot in a knot in a knot in a knot or something. Um, any finite picture is good, but something like a limit of those. So here you have a trefoil, and on the trefoil you put smaller trefoils, and on the smaller trefoils you put smaller trefoils, and so on. You can think of this limit of this picture. That's still a knot in the sense of continuous, but it's not a knot in the sense of polygon. Okay? And the same here like with those guys, so infinite, infinitely many kind of shrinking trefoils, and they kind of converge get smaller and smaller and converge to a point that's not a polygon. So anything we can ever draw in finite time, including this beast, which is still finite, it looks very scary. Actually, it looks very beautiful, actually. But anyway, um, this is still finite, but the limit is not. So we will throw out those knots. They are not polygon knots. And you can kind of see it already why they're not polygon knots. They kind of get too clustered around a certain point. Uh, so here, you get way too clustered around this point here. So you can't draw any finite line segments anymore to approximate the knot. And again, I'll show you some more pictures. So not good. Those things are a knot that it knots itself infinitely many times and then goes converges to a point. Uh, all those funny things. And you can imagine even worse pictures uh, or more beautiful pictures, whatever you want to, want to call it. And the point we kick them out is, is really they need a different theory. So you can't treat those objects using combinatorics only. They, they kind of obviously have some analysis component in them, like in this limit process of an infinite knotting of itself. Right, so this looks here very scary. This gets arbitrary close here. So eventually you can't draw any uh, polygons, here, any, any straight lines here anymore. But for every finite part of it, it's, it's still fine. So I can still approximate here everything, uh, every finite part with a polygon. In other words, this restriction is to get rid of those guys. That's not very inclusive. I, I totally understand, not very inclusive. So we have a club and a club of knots, and we kick those guys out. Certainly not very inclusive, but we get a much better theory. So if you build a theory, just think of yourself building a theory. So what you want is you want to have many examples in your theory, sure, otherwise the theory is a bit boring. But if you have too many examples, like those guys, your statements will get really weak because most of our statements will not apply for those knots. So in order to have a satisfying theory, we kind of selectively kick out uh, examples that we don't like and we really don't like. At least in this lecture, we really don't like those guys. And when I say not, I never mean these guys. Again, not very inclusive, but uh, these are not knots for me, although they are not in the continuous definition that I showed you uh, last time. Okay, come back here. I will never draw these things again, but essentially you can always do it, and it's crucial for the proof of the next theorem. And then we kind of forget about it and just uh, go ahead, go along with kind of the intuitive definition of a knot. The problem is the intuitive definition of a knot, say it again, fails because you can have, well, these very unintuitive, I guess, uh, counterexamples to the definition. So a knot in a knot in a knot in a knot and it knots itself uh, up to infinity. Okay. So you obviously can't really draw that in finite time, um, none of them, so they don't fall into our framework. Very good. So last time I already showed you, that was just, we kicked them out, right? very non-inclusive. Last time I already showed you what I mean by a projection. Uh, so let me pull up the projection again. And that's a point. We kind of want to project our knots to the plane, you will see it in a second, and then do combinatorics on the projection. And the beasts I just showed you, they just don't have any nice projections. So we can't do anything and we can't really play any combinatorics. So I will, in a, in a second, make the following precise. Um, there's a projection, there's a knot, there's a light source somewhere, and you get a, a, a two-dimensional picture of the knot. The only thing we additionally remember is what goes over and under, and we kind of need to potentially wiggle uh, the light source a little bit such that we get a not-too-crazy picture. And that's just not possible 
for those funny knots from before. So the white one is a picture of the colored one, and the colored one is a real knot, and the white one is the projection of the knot. The point is we will always study projections. And a projection is a, is a drawing, a shadow, whatever you want to call it, in R2. Not as an object in R3, a projection is an object in R2. And we only, well, we have two kinds of, we have those, those little uh, crossings that we call over and under crossings, so we remember which one crosses over in the projection. So it's a bit more than a shadow. A shadow won't see the difference. We just remember which one goes over and under. And um, the connected components, you can actually um, see them in the picture. So there are only two string segments. There's the one that goes under and the one that goes over. And there are two local pictures. Well, either this one goes over or so the right-hand side or the left-hand side goes over. And they really involve a choice of a projection. And a theorem, which I'm not going to show you, is that any of the polygon knots have a nice projection. And that's exactly why you need it. So it, it's not a priori clear if you have a very complicated knot. Why do you have a projection such that the only thing you ever see are those double points? There could be kind of a really bad projection where you have triple points or something. Uh, so, but we can always, if you have a triple point in a projection, you can always turn the light source by epsilon and get rid of the triple point. But the real problem, and that's a real warning here, and that's the whole essence of knot theory, is projections really great. We always work with projections. We always draw projections. But there's a choice involved, namely where we put our light source. I have a, I have a good picture for you in a second. So it's a bit ambiguous. Huh? So it's not completely trivial to tell the knot from its projection. And the whole point of knot theory is to develop tools to tell the knot from its projection. I have some, uh, some nice pictures in a second. And that's exactly what I said. So we kind of have to check kind of everything for the projections. And it should be independent of the choice of the light source involved. So wherever you put your little light source here. So here is an example of how projections look like. Um, the left-hand side, a mathematical knot. The right-hand side, actually, a knotted protein. So from a biology book, this is a stone from a biology book, they do exactly the same thing. And they also get, a t by some measuring of biology that I don't really understand, but they get the same pictures. And they need, have the same problem. They kind of need to tell the knottiness of the protein from the knottiness uh, from the pictures that you see by projecting. So here, that's the protein. And the red one is a more mathematical knot. And you can already see the knot stays the same, but the projection can be quite different. Um, that's a little bit easier to see in this picture here, because the picture is just simpler. But um, if you have a very complicated picture, the projection can be very, very, very different. Um, and it's, as I said again, it's important. The whole point of knot theory is to develop tools to tell the beast from its shadow. Right? That's the whole point of knot theory. And again, kind of fun, fun story, I said again, because it's pretty cool. A lot of applied math mathematicians, applied math biologists are not applied mathematicians. A lot of scientists actually use the same idea that we develop here, or that were developed in knot theory quite a while ago, uh, just for the sakeness of beauty. And then eventually, it actually showed up as uh, a main source of life. So last time, I showed you the DNA. Uh, this is a protein that's a little bit different, but they, they still live from their naughtiness. The main essential building blocks of life live from their naughtiness. And biologists study them exactly using the, uh, the ideas we have that we will show and we will see in today's lecture and in the coming up lectures. Um, so here's another one. Um, so let's try to, so all of these are different versions in, in some sense, strange projections, if you want, of the trefoil. Um, so this is kind of the standard picture of the trefoil. But I claim that all the others are trefoils as well. Um, I don't know. So let's check it. So to me, this really much looks like a trefoil. I don't have much trouble here to, this, to see that this is a trefoil. The other one, the next one, if you stare at it a little bit, I don't think this is so hard. 
Um, we have seen this in the animation, so give, let me give it a, 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 a check mark as well. This one is a bit harder to see. Um, this one is a bit trickier. Uh, this one is also a bit trickier. This one is obvious. And this one is also a bit trickier, so let's maybe analyze one of them. Um, let's take the red one at the bottom. So the red one goes, what is it, uh, over, and when I mean over, I, say, I mean from the left. So it goes over, under, uh, under, over. Okay, let me try to draw it. I hope I can. So drawing knots life is, is really tricky. Do I have some space somewhere? I probably do. So it goes over, it goes under, it goes under again, it goes over, and then it probably goes like this. I hope that's right. Uh, so let's double check again. So it goes over, if I start, I start reading from uh, here, it goes over, it goes under, it goes under, it goes over, and then it kind of repeats what it did. So let's have a look. Um, over, under, again reading from here onward, over, under, under, over. I think that's right. Very good. I'm very proud of myself right now. I managed to draw a non-trivial knot. And why is that a trefoil? Can we actually see that? Uh, let me see. What I would do is I would probably take this line and I would draw it all the way to here. So I, I take, it's, it's above the other crossing, so I could just pull it all the way to the other side. Maybe I can actually make a nice picture. Um, put this to the side, copy it, uh, get rid of the arrow, get rid of the arrow and redirect the edge. Let me see. So I'm trying to say that this line can actually also go all the way like this without any problems. Oh, that was not really good. Um, I want to wipe out. Very good. Or maybe some other. Now oh, better. Okay, so I redirected this beast here. And um, so this goes still over here. And this already looks way more like a trefoil. It goes over, under, over. It has the three crossings that we wanted. And eventually, I think I. Let me see it again. If I pull this over, actually, I get a little, a little, how can I draw this? I just pull this over, and I get a little kink up here that I can just remove. So I'm taking this line here, this line segment, and I pull it above the crossing here, so it ends up like the red one. This is a little kink. You get rid of the little kink, and you can see the, the trefoil, actually. We'll have some nicer animations in a second. This is just me trying to draw it. And drawing these notes is always a bit tricky. But you can already see the point here. It's not completely trivial. It's not a completely trivial operation even to tell um, this easy, this relatively simple projection uh, of the trefoil, uh, to, to say, really say it is a trefoil. And the picture on the right is, is kind of clearly the trefoil. It goes over, under. Uh, I can get rid of this beast here. It's just just nothing. Anyway, I can just get rid of it. It's gone. Bash. So it just goes uh, over, under, over. Exactly like our, um, where's our trefoil? Over, under, over. It's really just the same picture. But it was a non-trivial operation to actually get there. And the point is the following theorem, the main theorem of not theory, if you want. So I did, by the way, the last move. Um, we could try to see that again. So two knot diagrams represent the same knot in the equivalence that was very, very complicated. Um, if and only if you can relate them by this finite number of moves. They're usually called Reidemeister moves, and it's called Reidemeister theorem. They're numbered one, two, three, and I'll show you some videos so that we can get used to it. There's move zero, which usually gets uh, used silently, which is just straightening out, like, like the, the usual wiggling um, of diagrams. And the point is you never need any more moves. I mean, they obviously hold. Like, look at the second one. One strand is overneath the other, so you can pull it apart. But the point is you never need anything else. So in the last, uh, so I did this one and actually this one. So oops, if you remember, um, this pulling here of this string was the third move, and then I had this little kink. 
up here that I just removed, which was the first loop. And this is absolutely great because this is not diagrams, it's a statement about diagrams. Two diagrams present the same knot if and only if they're related by three or four, depends on how you count, uh, fairly simple and local moves. The proof of this theorem is hard. We don't do it, but this is the only point where this funny equivalent co comes into the game. And this is also the point where we need polygon knots. So this is not true for the other fun knots. So the main point of the proof is to match the definition of equivalence of knots with this much easier description of just uh, a certain number of moves. And the real point here is that this reduces all of, the also all of knot theory to combinatorics because you just now can stare at the diagrams and apply combinatorial uh, simplification moves. And we do that all the time. So let us have some look at some videos. So the, there's some knot. It will build itself in a second. Uh, God knows what it is. Very good. And there will be a second knot in a second. So there you go. That was a random master one move. It was a right advisor two, that was right advisor one, but we will see that slightly nicer in a second again. So let's go back and just do it stepwise. And you can always do it. That's a really cool theorem, actually, the right advisor theorem. So there you go. That's a, that was one of those moves, the right advisor one move. Uh, sorry, the two move. This was the unkicking, the right advisor one move. And we can go on. This was a move I did before. That's a funny right advisor three move. Now we can unkink again, very good. Let's write a master one move. And it looks way more like a reasonable knot which we have seen before. So those guys are exactly the right master moves. And the magic of the right master theorem is that these moves are enough. You'd never need any more, anything more. So let's do it again. So you do it locally. Can you see it? That's a right master three move. You do it locally and change the diagram locally. Very good, so we get a different diagram. So there you go, there's a right master two move. You do it locally, you simplify the diagram, and you do it locally. It's really brilliant, it's absolutely brilliant. You don't need to know any complicated form of equivalence, you just need to can, can do this. Just let me mention that you can always do it, also do it, in, you can do it in both directions. So you can make some, some move like that if you want. This is, this is an amazing theorem, a really beautiful theorem. So those three moves, um, that's exactly the theorem we just had on the slides, and that's the original paper drawn as polygon knots, as you can see. Okay, uh, another one for you, because random master moves are really, really important. Um, here's our knot. Very good, here's another knot. Very good. And the usual question is, are those the same? And we only see some projection. Could be that this is just really badly projected, or even simpler, is it the unknot or not? Mm. We kind of need to tell in some way. So let's have a look at an example. Um, two knots that will be compared, and they will turn out to be the same. So at first glance, it's absolutely not clear why they should be the same. This beast, and well, let's see. This is more like, so this one has a name. It's called the figure eight knot, because it has a figure eight. But from the outset, I can't tell whether they're the same. And the Reitermeister theorem tells us we actually should just apply Reitermeister moves. So let's do it. A Reitermeister two move. Remember, just a local operation. Um, I see a Reitermeister one move now. Um, there's a little kink, so I can get rid of the little kink here. So I just get rid of it. Reitermeister one move. Um, it gets a bit trickier. Probably do a Reitermeister three move. There you go. A Reitermeister three move put it again, the local operation. We can get rid of the last kink. That's a right master one move. And the uh, two pictures are actually the same. Right, let's get, let's get, wait until it's gone. And fuck, there you go. And, uh, sorry, it's not gone, it's already on the other side. So we just uh, unkink it again. Any two uh, diagrams, if they are the same, they will always be related by those. Uh, nice moves. Again, on one slide. 
OK, so we, we should be in some position now to address this question. Um, kind of the easiest one we would ask, is the trefoil actually equivalent to the unknot? Note that in, in the videos you, have just, uh, you just saw, I didn't solve this problem, right? So it was not addressed at all. And the problem we are facing is that we kind of know that all of these, well, the, if they are the same, there will be some sequence of those moves relating them, but there's no bound on the number of moves you need. So you might, let me just pull it up again, you might need to, uh, where was it at the very end somewhere, you might, like this one here, you might need to make the knot more complicated, like 500 steps, and then eventually you can simplify it back to the unknot, and that's absolutely not clear why uh, it's possible or not. So although this theorem is great, it usually only tells us if there are two projections and they are the same, then we try to do some brain yoga, uh, some visualization yoga, and try to connect them. But if they are not the same, we still don't have any good tools. It's exactly the same as for surfaces. So if they are not, if they are the same surfaces, we can somehow do some crazy operations to bend one into the other. But if they are not the same, well, it's much trickier because we would need, essentially we would need to prove that it's not possible, that nobody can ever come up with any form of Reitermeister moves relating the two. And that's not, in the, from the outset, it's not really clear how that should work. Um, the answer is obviously your brain already tells you they're not the same, right? But we need to verify that uh, mathematically. We have no, no tools so far to do that. Absolutely not. I just told you, if they would be the same, I said again, you would be able to use Reitermeister, and eventually you will see that they are the same. But to show that two knots are not the same, we don't have any tools, because there is no bound on the moves you need, and maybe there's some really crazy combination of, of those moves that moves uh, from one to the other. It's not, but we can't prove that right now. So we definitely need some tools, and here comes a really cool idea of doing that. So we want invariants, like the Euler characteristic. The, the Euler characteristic was the first invariant for surfaces we had, and essentially was compute a number associated to surface. If the numbers are different, the surfaces are different. And we will do the same for knots. And I would like to color a knot projection, and I will show you in a second what that means. So I have three colors, um, and I call them well, <laughs> blue, green, and red. And I would like them to be colored around a, uh, around a crossing like this. So the overgoing strand gets one of the three colors, and the two other strands get the remaining two colors, as a, the, the broken strand gets the remaining two colors. A little bit tricky, it's also allowed, and that's why I have this picture here, show you some more pictures in a second, to have a completely monochromatic crossing. So two, two options. Either a crossing is completely monochromatic, let me draw one in blue maybe, so this one would also be okay, it's completely monochromatic, or all three colors appear. Completely monochromatic, or all three colors appear. Okay? And this is called the three coloring, and if a knot projection has a three coloring that uses all three colors, so monochromatic ones are a little bit boring, we take them out. If it has something that uses all colors, we call it three colorable. So we color the knot. We'll see some nice examples in a second. But the point is all three colors need to appear. And we would like to count the different number of three colorings of a knot. And that's a knot invariant. Um, in this setup, I count the boring ones as well. So there is a monochromatic blue coloring, there's a monochromatic red coloring, there's a monochromatic green coloring, so this is at least three. And I care about the rest. So. Um, it's at least three. I always have some monochromatic colorings. And the question is, can I find, can I find anything else? And we can. So, so it's three colorable if and only if this is straight. And three colorability is a not invariant. So it tells, in like the older characteristic. Okay, let me show you some pictures. So for the unknot, well, there are exactly three colorings, the monochromatic blue one, the monochromatic red one, and the monochromatic green one. So the unknot always ends up as being three. So every knot that has more than three is not the unknot. That's the whole point. As soon as you have bigger than three, it's not the unknot. 
Uh, so we would like to apply that to kind of nodes and see what comes out. Say it again, the unmod is monochromatic. It only has a monochromatic solution. So everything that allows an, a different solution that is not monochromatic is not the unmod. And that's a really, really powerful way of checking whether something is the unmod or not. So let's do the trefoil together. Um, I have some pictures, there you go. So I claim the number is nine. So we have the three monochromatic solutions. I hope we understand those. Okay, so fine, we check them, who cares? But we have other solutions as well. And the only thing we need to make sure, let's look at this one here, for example. The only thing we need to make sure is that at every crossing, we have all three colors present. So here at the bottom crossing, we have green, blue, and red. So this crossing checks. Here we have the red going over, the blue and the green, crossing checks. Here we have blue, red, and green, crossing checks. Let's see here, this one works, this one works, this one works, and so on. So for, for the trefoil, the number is nine, which shows, I haven't showed you the statement yet, but this shows that the trefoil is non-trivial because the, the unknot only allows three. Yeah? So here it is nine. And it's a very simple way of doing it. Just look at the knot projection and color it with three colors. Um, to check that the trefoil is not the unknot, you don't need to find all of them. You just need to find one of the non-monochromatic non ones. So as soon as you have found this one, um, you're actually already good. It can't exist for the, for the unknot, so the trefoil can't be trivial. But um, just counting all of them is a finite invariant. So there could be a knot which is also three colorable, uh, the number of three colors is whatever, 11, then you know it's not the trefoil as well, for example. It depends a bit what you want to do. But it's a really simple idea. Just color the, uh, the, the strengths of the projection. Well, the strengths of the projection are those three things here, so everything that is connected in the diagram. Um, and you have just one rule around each, each crossing, you want to see all colors. If you can do it, it's a zero or one question, right? If you can do it, it's three colorable. If you can't, well, it's not. So the, the unknot is not three colorable because it has only three solutions. And the theorem is, this thing is a not invariant. Right? That, that, that is, it doesn't depend on the projection. So for any, any projection will spit out the same number. In particular, we can just check on the projection um, the number of colorings. And it's exactly the same, it's an integer, like the order characteristic, and it helps us to tell knots apart. And the formal statement is that it's a knot invariant. And knot theory is about writing down knot invariants. So here, for the trefoil, we get nine, for example. The number for the trefoil is nine, the number for the unknot is three, they can't be the same. Make some sense? And just, well, the theorem, not the difference between the theorem and the corollary. The theorem says the number is a not invariant, and the corollary is only about the inequality uh, being bigger than three or not. Right? So that's the three colorability. And that's also not invariant. So you have two invariants, essentially they're the same, of course. But um, either you count all colorings that might get a little bit demanding because they're usually very, very, uh, quite a lot of colorings. Or you just check whether there's one. And that's very, very fast and very powerful. So just check whether there's one of those funny colorings. Yeah, and um, the corollary follows from the theorem. And the point is, can we prove this theorem? Is it impossible to prove? It looks very complicated. But the point is, it's actually sufficient that this number is invariant under the Reitermeister moves. Because right and my stem moves, uh, we already know that they connect all projections. So if this number is invariant under the right and my stem moves, every projection will spit out the same number. And that's how you prove not invariants all the time. You check that the invariant is invariant under the right and my stem moves, which is the whole power, if you want, I will pull it up again because it's so great, of the theorem um, that you only ever need to track those moves. Right? These determine the equivalence class of knots. So if your invariant is in, well, invariant under those, it doesn't change. You have proven that it's an invariant. And this is absolutely great. Why is that great? This is a completely local argument. Remember, 
Um, maybe this one was the nicest one. It's a completely, no, the other one was a little bit better. Uh, it's a completely local argument. You just do it, uh, oh, this one is not bad. You just do it in a local neighborhood and you never touch anything else. So you just need to check local pieces of the knot, uh, which makes the whole story so ridiculously great. Okay, um, let us see whether we can actually do that together now. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so twisting, ooh, so randomize that one move. They got a little bit bad here in my code, apparently. So let me just redraw them. So this is this move here. This one is equal to this one. Well, let's see. I just showed you, um, I just showed you that it's invariant under the Weidemeister moves. But let me go to the, the colors we had before. Uh, so let me just put this in, for example, red. So it's the starting color of your strand is red. Could be. The, my colors were red, blue, and green. Could be, for example, red. Then you can completely monochromatic color the, the crossing and you get uh, a legal color on the other knot as well, and similarly by going backwards. So the number is invariant under this move, and uh, this one here is just a flipped version. So let me just do it in the other color. It could be blue, for example, and uh, can, can I actually draw that? I should be able to draw that. Uh, give me another try. You just monochromatic color the crossing, and the number of colorings doesn't change going from left to right. Yeah. Let us do this move. I probably need some space for this move. Randomize that two. So randomize that two, let me just draw it, is this one here. Okay, so let's do that together. It could be, for example, that this crossing comes out. It now has a few cases. It could be that it comes out, uh, so this crossing, this local picture comes out as being colored red and blue already. So can we find a red-blue coloring of the other picture, remember they live in a little bubble here, such that the boundary color doesn't change because we, we don't want to change the color in the rest of the knot, but the local picture makes sense. So the boundary color here is blue and red. So let me try to draw a blue-red coloring of the other knot. So this strand is easy, it just goes over. And what does this strand do? Well, it can't stay blue anymore, but it can get green. So if you have a two-colored uh, existing well, starting point, you can also color the other one. And again, the number of colorings will stay the same. Uh, let me do another example for you. It could be that our starting color is red-red, um, but then I can just pull it over monochromatically to the other side. So again, number of colorings stays fixed. And I won't do it, but you can. I actually do the same uh, for the braiding move, the Rademaster 3 move. It's just a check. You just have uh, uh, two, <laughs> 3 to the third, so 27 possible colorings of, of one picture, and you just show that they correspond to 27 colorings of the other picture in general. So whenever you have a coloring on one, so 27 is just the upper bound. Um, whenever you have a coloring on one side, you have a coloring on the other side. Okay, let me try to do this again, just to be completely clear here. Um, maybe I have a little bit more space here. No, I don't. Uh, let me try to get rid of this guy here. So I'll randomize that two move. It could come out as blue and green, for example. And on the other side, oh, maybe a nicer green line. I could do something like green, green. The blue one goes like this, and then there's a red one in between. And that's a perfect matching be, uh, between a fixed coloring on the right-hand side and a coloring on the left-hand side. So the number of colorings is invariant under the Rademeister moves. So no matter what we do, we can always find an invariant under the Rademeister moves. So let me be very brave now and try our try to three-color um, the this one here, so if you try to three color this one, the figure eight knot, so let's see what we can actually do. So um, maybe, because this is already red essentially, I swap to uh, black for red, that's a little bit more visible. So I can color this line here 
in red. Very good. Um, so it needs to change colors here. So uh, up to symmetry, I can assume that this continues as, uh, what is it, green. So now here it goes under, so it needs to swap colors to blue. Blue goes over. It needs to swap colors here back to black. Whoops, that doesn't work. So we get stuck here. Uh, and if you convince yourself that nothing you ever try will work, um, I can give it another try if you want. Uh, so one more. So this is a not three color or not. I could start, let's say, coloring this line here. This was bad. Coloring this line here red. Okay, I, I know that it needs to swap colors here. So up to symmetry, I can say it's blue. It goes all the way to here. I know it needs to swap colors here in order to work with this crossing. I would like it to be green. Here, it needs to swap colors, so it needs to get blue again. But, uh-oh, now we have problems here because this crossing is a blue-blue-green crossing, and we don't like blue-blue-green crossings. And no matter what you try to this knot, actually, uh, it's not pre colorable. So it's not a perfect invariant. So we can say, let me just wrap up this using the theorem, that so this one here or this one here, that the trefoil over, under, uh, over, under, that uh, was a really bad projection of the trefoil, but it is actually the trefoil. That this one is not the unknot, because one of them is uh, not, is three colorable, the other one isn't. We can say that it is not the, the figure eight knot, which I probably can't draw anyway, so let me just write figure eight uh, knot. So the one from the previous, the one that I tried to color previously, because the figure eight knot is also not very colorable, but we can't distinguish those two guys here, for example. It's the same with the older characteristic. We have no idea what, whether those two are the same, because they turn out to be, uh, for, for both of them, CK is, is three. And this should remind you of the Euler characteristic. So Euler characteristic can tell a torus apart from a sphere. Sphere is Euler characteristic two, torus is Euler characteristic zero, but it can't distinguish a torus from a Klein bottle because they have both Euler characteristic zero. It's the same here. So the three coloring is a cool invariant, and whenever I ask you, are two knots are the same, try this one first because it's pretty simple, um, but it might fail. It's like the Euler characteristic. So we might do, a, we need to do a little bit more uh, next time to um, get this work. And remember the way I proved it is actually a really, really simple coloring argument on the main, kind of the main theorem for today on uh, the Rademeister theorem. And um, so for each Rademeister move, there's a unique way to complete any coloring. And that's what I showed you, which shows the, um, the theorem from the previous slide. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it for today. And next week, we continue with more naughty things. Right? right now, we don't have a perfect invariant. It's just a funny one. And it helps to distinguish the trefoil from the unknot. But for example, you can't distinguish the figure eight knot from the unknot. Thank you very much. <laughs>